morning, science lovers. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Nice to see you all here again. Uh, Mike Winter is uh, off on some adventure, and uh, he'll be back one of these days soon. But uh, in the meantime, we are having our Science Sundays as normal. Um, we're going to be doing a Science Sunday on October 1st as well. Uh, instead of Mike leading that one, I'll be doing that one and continuing with his theme of life and biology. Um, I'm going to be talking about survivors, which are species that exist on Earth today that have been around for a very long time. All of you are probably familiar with the coelacanth, that uh, ancient sort of fish that was rediscovered after having thought to have been extinct for millions of years. There are other examples of very ancient lineages of organisms. Um, also coming up soon in uh, October, on the third Wednesday evening in October, uh, the humanists of West Suburban Chicago land we are sponsoring a event with um, Congressman Bill Foster, and he'll be talking to us uh, about whatever he wishes, but I, I suspect that some of it will include uh, his role as the only, or his perspective as the only scientist in Congress. Uh, that'll be interesting. Uh, so second Wednesday evening in, uh, in October. All right, uh, today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Joanne Reed. Um, you, those of you who have attended Science Sunday regularly know that uh, Joanne has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, she has a fairly encyclopedic grasp of everything, as far as I know. And uh, she, <laughs> she an uh, amazing, amazing person, an amazing intellect. And uh, she and uh, her wife have previously run a business uh, dealing with teaching critical thinking in corporations. And she has her PhD in education where she did her specialty in um, the before and after effects of teaching students critical thinking and then discerning whether or not that made a, a, a difference to the quality of the education outcomes. So critical thinking is something that I know that she is passionate about, and uh, that she will be talking to us at least three times this year about uh, critical thinking, what it means, how to develop it, uh, etc. So it is again my pleasure to introduce to you my dear friend and um, colleague, Dr. Joanne Lee. Jeans just wouldn't cut it, you know. <laughs> so, good morning. Uh, I was going to start this morning with uh, the, the part one of uh, critical thinking. Uh, when you teach critical thinking, I have to turn the words around, as we'll notice. In other words, it's thinking critically. The first thing we always have to do is get rid of prejudices and biases. And so, we're going to start by looking at the entire input system of the human being. Where do we get our information from? And is that a source of bias? Now, if I've worked everything out all right, this should work. Ready? Look at that. Isn't that cool? All right, so I will start with a definition. Now, this one is mine. Uh, thinking critically. I don't like the term critical thinking because that makes it sound like a noun. It is not. It is not something you can own, something you can possess, something you can buy, something you can store away, something you can put in a mason jar. It is a mental process. So it is a verb. You'll hear all sorts of people doing weird things with thinking critically and critical thinking and ending up trying to convince you that you cannot ever learn to think critically, which of course is wrong. Um, so it's a mental process. Where we take all of our life, we take all of our knowledge, all of our skills, all of our abilities, 
and combine them in such a way that we promote problem solving, we look at rational decision making, rational, you like that? Not just aim, shoot, fire, yeah, none of those. And enhance creativity. This is something that you might not expect, but yes, we enhance creativity in the same manner. Um, thinking. Here's a basic chart of how we think. We start out with the idea of acquiring knowledge. We then store it, and then we recall it. Um, this whole process is somewhat related to one another. That is, if you're going to recall information, you want to store it in a similar manner. And we're really going to look at the bottom left down here, the acquisition of knowledge. Uh, all of our knowledge is, is obtained through these five senses. That's what we got. That's how we interface with the universe. If we didn't have these five senses, we'd be lost. And so we have to ask ourselves, amongst these five senses, which ones do we use the most? Which ones is most effective? Which ones do we bring most of the information of our world? Now, this is from Rosenblum, who is one of the cognitive scientists who works in this area. And if you should look it up, you'll find most of the people say something on this order. Currently, 80 to 85 percent of our total input is through our eyes. About 11 percent is through our ears. And the rest is scattered through touch and taste and, and smell. Which I find interesting because in all educational institutions, you are taught through your ears. But 85 percent of your input is through your eyes. And so hopefully, using your eyes, we will have a greater effect. Now, as we look at this 83% of sight, we say, what is sight? Uh, what's the general idea of what, what we're doing here? Well, we have to look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum of the universe. And we say, whoa, cool, what's that? Well, it goes everywhere from way down here at this end, which involves the very, very, very high energy waves, gamma rays, high energy x-rays, the things that will kill you. And fortunately, our atmosphere blocks them out. Yay! Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. Up the other end, we have the extremely low energy waves. And we just saw an interesting example just uh, earlier this year of a gravity wave. So these are the extremely low energy waves. And again, our atmosphere blocks out all of these in this area. There are two windows. There is this window here, which is the radio waves, which is really cool because we all have radios, we have televisions, we want to see the stars and that kind of thing. And that's an open area. This is the area that we see. This is all. So in the entire electromagnetic spectrum, that's it. Now, also notice that this is log scale. So this goes up by factors of 10 every time. So this is, it. this is what we see. So immediately we say we are blocked out from almost all the universe. We don't see the universe. We see a very, very, very tiny fraction of the universe, and that's our fraction. It goes from violet to red. We can see the energy spectrum here. It goes from a relatively low, relatively high energy here to a relatively low energy here. Beyond the ultraviolet is ultraviolet. And some insects can see the ultraviolet, some birds can see it, we can't. Beyond the red is the infrared or heat. And it was Isaac Newton that discovered this by putting a, uh, a thermometer next to the spectrum that he introduced in the prism, and he observed that the heat was raising the temperature of the thermometer. Whoa, there's something there. Now, there's something there outside of our range of sight. So we are already extremely limited. Our bias is built in. We can't see the universe. We challenge our sense of sight with all of these wonderful optical illusions. That is, do we in fact see what we think we see? And the answer is, well, let's take a look. The impossible. Yeah, it can't happen. 
And this is one of the joys of optical illusion. So we know what can't happen. But we're fascinated by it anyway. We said, how do they do that? Escher, also. Oh, cool. We have a couple of Eschers, and, and I just love to stare at them. You know, it's just amazing. But what we can't really see. Another example. This cannot exist in the three-dimensional universe. But it, there it is. And we're fascinated by it. Wow, cool. What is this? Now, some of these optical illusions, you have to take time. That is, it's complex in one way or another, and you have to sort of sit and look at it for a moment. And say, what is this? This is a classic. Which do you see? The young lady or the old hag? Now, Scott and I were talking about this very illusion. Scott sees the young lady first and has to work to see the old hag. I see the old hag, but don't see, and I have to work at it. And this is part of that process, which brings us back to the idea of, is this sight? There's just photons coming at me. If it was strictly sight, strictly your eyes, you would see both, or neither, ever. And so there is some interpretive process going on here. And notice that you can't see both at the same time. You switch back and forth. Your brain sees one, then your brain sees the other, and there's the answer. It's not your eyes, it's your brain, which is your center of sight. Here's another one, a classic. Do you see one phase, or do you see two? And again, it flips back and forth. It's the same photons. The photons never change. The eye only sees one object here. So where is the sight coming from? The sight obviously can't be coming from your eyes. It has to be some other process, which sort of leaves us with the brain. Um, here's another one. Now, I'll watch, why don't you watch it? See, you can see the giraffe. Now, this will take a moment or two. You really have to concentrate on it. Now, some of you will see it, some of you won't. And... <laughs> okay, those were all 2D, right? And so we say to ourselves, well, it's a piece of... Come on, it's flat. I mean, you can do all these kinds of things because it's not real. What about in the 3D world, the actual 3D world where we live? Do you have that same kind of optical illusions in the 3D world? Well, let's take a look. Sight 
the eyes or recite the brain? Or is it some combination? And I keep coming back to the conclusion, as everyone else does also, the eyes are detectors. The brain is the computer. It is the brain which interprets all the data to make sense. Now, making sense means we eliminate stuff and we add stuff. And this is, of course, the very definition of bias. We are changing the world to meet our local needs as a human being. Monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half miss the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it, but did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? 
Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. What's a gorilla amongst friends, right? <laughs> Again, uh, this is a classic series of experiments that have been performed. Uh, in other words, a bank robbery going on, and you're asked to uh, see and check and look at this because you're an investigator, and you have to see about the criminal. And again, the gorilla works in front of you, and you don't see it. This is that, that unawareness. You're focusing so much on one particular subject that you don't see everything else. And we'll explore this in some greater detail in the next slide. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. That is sort of a halfway in between. <clears throat> this is a uh, Possibly also an example of what's called change blindness. Uh, change blindness is, a, is a thing, and this is a direct quote, so the word surprising gets in the way. It's a surprising phenomenon, okay? You're all surprised um, that this, this change is going to occur um, and, and you're not going to notice it. You're going to be standing there, observing, you're right there. A change occurs and you don't notice it right in front of your eyes. Most of us think we're pretty observant, but with a bit of mind control, I wanted to see if I could make these people take even the most obvious things for granted. Excuse me, do you know how to get to Trinity Church from here? Yeah. 
You see that church down there? Yep, straight through there. And then you keep going down there. Sorry. Sorry. Which way? You see where that church is down there? Yeah. You stay on that, which is at Bleak Broadway. And then you walk down two or three blocks and Trinity Church is over by the inside. We're walking in that direction. Okay. Excuse me, you don't know where Trinity Church is, do you? Might be Wall Street and Broadway. Okay. Well, we're, we're down here somewhere, aren't we? Yeah, you see Trinity Church. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Inside the Trinity Church. Right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you keep going that way, then you left Broadway, then you go down a couple of blocks. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks very much. That seemed almost too easy, so later on I see how far I can take it. Excuse me, do you know where uh, Trinity Church is? In that okay. Yeah. Last time I switched with someone who looked a little bit like me, but where's the fun in that? Oh, excuse me. You know who, who best to rock you? you? The other side. You see where that lady's standing? Sure. And that's the pool. No, the lady in the gray. The other side? Yeah, the other side of but the pool. But you say you don't know where it is? Uh, exactly what street, no, but it's in that direction. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Do you know where um, Trinity Church is from here? Uh, yeah, fine. Come on, come on. I'll take you. Or you want to walk now? Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to catch some other people. Sorry, so, sorry guys. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, listen. Saying. Once you go on Broadway. Yes. Remember the numbers are going. I could have sworn it was another guy. <laughs> um, on. Once you hit the Broadway, you're going down. Yes. Walk up straight so that, that way. way. And just walk straight down. You're brilliant. gonna see it. It's, right, it's really brown. That's brilliant. Thanks for your help. All right, fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Excuse me. Do you know where Trinity Church is? Yeah. Ah, great. What do we do, Where are we on here? We sort of there. We're right here. Right here. Thank you. Go on. We are Brooklyn Bridge. You want to cross over there? Go down Broadway and I'll be right there. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, mate, do you know this area? Do you know the area? Do you know where uh, Portland's? Piccadilly Circus? Oh, uh, you the three. So through there? Yeah, through there. Uh, you're less less clear. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on for me. Where? Keep going this way. This way. Oh, thank you very much. No oh, careful of the car. Okay, Cheers, thanks. mate. Thank you. Excuse me. Are you, are you familiar with this area? No. No. Okay. All right. Uh, Piccadilly Circus. Piccadilly Circus. Um, coming yeah. back here. Piccadilly Circus is. Oh, right sorry. Here. Hang on. Sorry. Sorry. Which? Um, I just thought right here. Okay, so is that straight over? Definitely not that way. Um, Piccadilly Circus, I know, is that direction. It's over so. that way. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Do you know this area at all? Uh, a little bit. Do you want to get to St Paul's from here? I'm not even quite sure where we are. Just, uh, just trying to work out where I'm going. We are here. Right, okay. Yeah, I think it's sort of down there. I'm sure that wouldn't have worked quite as well if I was a very famous pop star. Well, it took me over two hours to find Francesco's keys, which was disappointing. But I did go to Venice for free, and I didn't fall into the canal on the way home like a twat. Sorry, I need to get some pools from here. Uh, yeah, you were a twat. Um... Oh, okay. Mm. Do you know where we are on here? Is that is that down in this direction there? Yeah, yeah, that right there is Old Broad Street. And the other 
was a spectator. So again, this brings us back to the idea, if you're in the middle of it, you don't see it. If you're on the outside, you do. And we'll look at this change in perspective a little bit as we're continuing along. Um, so we're beginning to feel a little put upon. We're beginning to distrust this 83% of your sensory input. We should. Um, hang in there, though. It, it, it does get worse. <laughs> sense of sight easily <clears throat> and are we really confusing the optic with the brain yeah we really do we think of sight as being our eyes and it has nothing to do with our eyes evidently we can be completely fooled 100% of the time all it takes is skill and the fact that we know you don't pay attention to what everything is going on so we must also ask does sight affect the other senses? Is there any kind of a crossover between these? Um, what would happen, for instance, if I took glasses of water 
and I made them all sorts of different colors. And I asked you, what flavor is this? <clears throat> you would choose a flavor that matched the color, <clears throat> even though it's just plain water. This is a classic. And this is a classic experiment. Again, this is just being run by a group of students. They, uh, they took fruit juice, they added color to it, and just ran the experiment again. It's been done a lot of times. I don't know, it's in between like like a flat sprite or like a lemonade. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um is it like lemonade? Lemonade? Is that blueberry? Hmm? Blueberry? I don't know, can I try it? No. <laughs> no. I don't know, blue raspberry. Okay. Blue raspberry. Is it like blue raspberry? Sure. If that's what you think. Okay. Okay. It wasn't the same as the other ones. So I don't want to say strawberry. Maybe watermelon. <laughs> watermelon, <laughs> maybe. <Okay. laughs> or just tell us what flavor you think that one is. Something gross. <laughs> um. <laughs> Watermelon? I don't know. <laughs> um, Hawaiian punch. Okay. It kind of tastes mainly like fruit punch, sort of. Fruit punch? Yeah. Okay. Fruit punch. Okay. okay. I get that apple cider thing. Apple cider? Okay. Like the whole thing. Go. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this smells what they need. Michelle, what they need. One and Christine. I like some oranges. Orange. <laughs> and mine. That's so funny. You can find boogies. Don't say anything, Keisha. Okay. What flavor do you think it is? <laughs> I have no idea. It tastes like chicken. Keisha, what flavor do you think? Uh, okay. Taste orange. Okay. Don't sniff it, just drink it. Okay. <laughs> Why'd you make a disgusting face? <laughs> <laughs> I know what to expect. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> what does it taste like? I could tell y'all made this. <laughs> it tastes weird. It tastes like grape. What do you taste, Ashley? It's not grape. <laughs> what do you taste? I don't know. Whoa, this is blue? <laughs> it now it's green. green. Oh. Uh, can you stop recording? <laughs> It tastes like great. Mm -hmm. And Ashley? No, I don't think it, I, I didn't know what it tastes like, but I don't think it tastes Do you like need great. more? I don't need more. <laughs> so then what do you think it is? <laughs> just say anything. <laughs> All right, so can I just say it tastes like grass? Will that help support your hypothesis? Yes, grass? thanks. It tastes so like grass. Okay, well, I don't thanks. I know what grass tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it up right here. It's kale juice. <laughs> That's right, can you drink it? I know, stop being so shy. <laughs> wow, we're ready. It's the <laughs> what, what flavor? What flavor? Fruit punch. These are the results, and they actually are pretty good uh, for this very, very small experiment. Uh, invariably, we find that sight interferes with taste. When we remove sight from the equation, then the only thing you've got left is this and this. And so you're much more capable 
of then determining what the flavor is. But the moment you see that 83% takes over and by golly, that must be right, because that's what you see. Now, we've seen that uh, sight, there's an overlap between sight and taste. Um, does sight overlap with any of the other senses? Well, yes, it, it really does. Uh, in fact, all of our senses appear to interact. Sense of your senses. Dorothy Latham is an ordinary woman with an extraordinary way of seeing the world. For her, the letters and numbers we see in monochrome appear in living color. A simple railroad timetable jumps off the board as colorful as a rainbow. Manning tree is quite a mid-green because of the big M at the beginning, and my M is mid-green. Norwich is a bright yellow word because my ends are bright yellow. The reality of it is white on blue, but the images of the riot of colour are in my mind. And it's not just written words that give Dorothy a technicolour experience. Spoken words have an even stranger effect. Platform 12 is the delayed 12.03 from Braintree. I see the words spelled out letter by letter on a sort of ticker tape in front of my forehead here. And I do see the letters in colour, in my colours. All passengers, please remain on the concourse. Dorothy knows the colours aren't really there, but for much of her life, she has had no idea why she sees them. Science finally has a theory that these colors are triggered by the intermingling of her senses of vision and hearing, a condition scientists are finally seeing as real. I imagined everybody would be exactly the same until I spoke to school friends about it when I was about 10, and they said, you're imagining it, and you're a weirdo, and so I shut up about it and kept quiet. Dorothy has the most common form of synesthesia. She mixes colors with her other senses. Research shows that about one out of every 300 people has at least one pair of overlapping senses. Wow. Uh -huh. Can you imagine that? As someone is talking to you, you're seeing it as a ticker tape scrolling across your field of vision in color? Cool, huh? I think we'll interfere with my driving. <laughs> now, again, they said one in 300, so statistically there might be a person in this room who is a synesthesian. We have, you're up in the, what is yours? Mine is that I see colors when I listen to music. Mine is that I see colors when I listen to music. Oh, colors and music. So again, now we have the sense of hearing and the sense of sight interacting in a different way. I'm sort of jealous, really. I just, it doesn't. But I would like to have an additional sense of these things. We'll get into that in a little bit, too. But is this the coolest thing? Now, does it actually depend upon the fact that you can see? Now, we'll take a look at something and say, can you actually see? even when you can't see. Going on inside the brain. One out. Two out. John Fullwood may help them answer that question. A synesthete, he sees colors triggered by spoken words. Incredible, since John is blind. They're just like flashing colors. For example, one will be a, a whitish color. One out. Two will be an orangey color. Two out. Three out. Four and five are sort of r reddish colors. Four out. Five. Surprisingly for John, not all words appear in color. 
Since childhood, only words that fit into sequences, like numbers or days of the week or months of the year, have color. Jump! I think as, as soon as I started to be aware of things that needed to be ordered, I started to at attach colors and, uh, and spatial attributes to them. Incredibly, John's blindness has not stopped him from experiencing color. Uh, so is his synesthesia a benefit or a hindrance? It's a nice thing to have because it, it, it enables you to be able to distinguish things w one from another. Uh, you can distinguish Saturday from Sunday because they've got different colors. Because he's blind, John is an ideal person to study. His synesthesia cannot possibly be influenced by signals from his eyes. So his ability to see colors must be triggered by something deep inside his brain. Okay, keep your head nice and still. At Oxford University, Megan Stephen is conducting an experiment. Using brain imaging technology, she's hoping to discover exactly what's going on when John sees synesthetic colors. A scanner will highlight the parts of his brain that are activated when he hears words. Okay, John, we're going to do the first experiment now. Um, what I'd like you to do is just um, relax and listen first, to the words that... First, Megan monitors John's brain activity Master when he listens to words that don't show up in color. Like exquisite, society, more. Okay, John, how did that go? Okay, yeah. Neuroscientists have discovered that each of our senses are normally processed in different areas of the brain. Vision areas should only be triggered by signals from the eye. Hearing by signals from the ears. It's even the same with tactile senses, like touch. If you look at the brain, the anatomy of the brain and how it's organized, look at where the nerve, the obvious nerve bundles go to, it all looks as though the senses are completely separate from each other. As expected, as he listens to these ordinary words, John's scan shows brain activity in his sound processing areas. Okay, here we go. But then Megan reads from a list of words that for John trigger colors. February. April. Saturday. The scan reveals something very intriguing. When he hears words that appear in color, not only is the sound area of his brain active, but so are parts of his visual region, parts of the brain that should only be activated by a signal from the eye. When John hears words like Monday or January, he sees a specific color, and you can see here the area of his brain that lights up when he sees that color, an area of the brain we call V4. It's a visual area, and it's an area that processes information about color. We also have another area that's lit up at the same time, and that's an area we call V1, another visual area. If a sighted person were to look at red, you would see these same areas of the brain activated. But John, of course, is, is blind, so we know that the only way he could be activating these areas of the brain that process vision and color is through the synesthesia. These conclusions indicate that synesthesia is the result of connections between regions of the brain which are typically completely separate. That, I think, must mean that particular groups of nerve cells are becoming connected, functionally somehow, connected together with each other. So one, when one group of nerve cells fires off, then another bunch somewhere else, maybe a long way away in the brain, very specifically, fires off together with it. And you get these conjunctions of, of sensation. It makes me confident that I'm not actually making this up. We've got hard proof now. You can tell your wife that you weren't kidding all along. <laughs> It now appears that these unusual connections within the brains of synesthetes create the sense of a strange world that doesn't actually exist. Weird, huh? The man is blind. I have two important questions though. First off, what color is wanky? I don't I fail to understand this one. Uh, and the other thing is, 
How does he know that it's red? Um, so, which brings up the, the logical question of when I see red, I know what I'm saying. I know what red is. You're wearing a red shirt. Do you see the same red I see? When we both say red, are we saying the same color? This is one of those wonderful philosophical things that we argued for years and years and years until this Japanese scientist came up with the Ishihara color test. Now, this is an extensive test. This is only four of these little blank things here. There are something around 70 or 80 of them. And if you go through all of them, there are numbers, there are letters, there are squiggles, there are all sorts of things. And if you have, <clears throat> ready for this, normal vision, whatever that means, you will see all of those squiggles and numbers and letters. And if you don't, you won't. You will miss some of them because they're not within your visual field. Now, these are one of those things that uh, I was always interested because my dad was colorblind. Uh, he and the color green had a non-relationship. When it was green, it was white. And this caused all sorts of problems because that meant that most of the world was gray. And they would have an uh, uh They were cruel. You know how cruel people can be. George, what color is that? Gray. <laughs> well, about, uh, and then during World War II, uh, he flew up here to Mitchell Field which was the most heavily camouflaged air base in the United States. And the guys in the tower used to have fun. They, they'd watch the airplanes fly over. They'd go, no, you went too far. Turn around and go to fly. Well, my dad turned to his pilot and said, why aren't you landing? And the guy says, where? He says, the airport. And the guy says, well, if you're so damn smart, we landed. So we did. Now, he was only a mechanic. So he wasn't supposed to do this in the first place. But he put it down. And they were immediately surrounded by MPs. How could you possibly have seen this? Well, he's looking at an orange field on a white background. Of course he can see it. Now, fortunately for, for me, my existence, um, it took a while for the Army Air Corps to follow the, the British uh, in that colorblind people were put in the lead aircraft in a bomber group because they would spot right through all of the camouflage and they would leave the, the bomber group in and that's where it is. And their life expectancy was six missions. I exist. Yay! <laughs> but he got back at us. In the early 60s, now this is the early 60s, my dad went to an optometrist and he, he was talking about his color blindness. He says, you know we can cure that. And dad goes, what? He says, yeah. They gave him one red lens. He popped it in one eye, and suddenly he saw the same spectrum because the light was removed, and the two eyes saw a slightly different spectrum, and the brain interpreted this as color. He got back at us. We'd be walking through the woods, and he'd go, look at the bird. He's looking at an orange bird in a white tree. Yes, he can see it. What are we looking at? Huh? Oh, he would, he'd hand this up. He'd reach in his pocket and he'd pull out his little lens cap and he'd very laboriously uh, uh, put it in and then he'd uh, blink a lot and he'd look up and he'd go, Oh hell, you can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> he did look funny though with one red eye. <laughs> so, with the issue of her, I can now say, if you see the same colors I see, and you go to the Ishihara, yes, we can say, I see the same red you see, or we can make gradations and say, well, actually, you're seeing in this realm better than you're seeing in this realm. And so, when we get the idea of colors, your red and mine may be different, or they may be the same. But now we can, in fact, test them. Yeah, good question, huh? Really good question. Well, I mean
been doing tricks with cards, signed cards. But I want to show you, most people say, you must go through a lot of cards, yeah. which, yeah, it's true. So I actually started collecting all the Jokers, because I started getting a lot of Jokers. So I have that Joker. What I brought here was four Jokers, right? So can you hold out your hands, like two tables? Here, uh, so if I give you this Joker, put it there. And this Joker, I'll put here. But uh, hold on, hold on. Let's build up a little suspense. I'll put them face down, right? Yeah. So you got those Jokers, and I got this Joker, and that Joker. See, now if I was to, if I was to do that and switch the Jokers, that wouldn't be too impressive, because yeah. you saw it. Yeah. But the cool thing is, when I go like that, bam, bam, and switch them like that, yeah. do you see them all switch? Now you switch them? Turn them over to Aces. Oh. Right, but here's the weird thing with the aces. Watch, watch. <laughs> watch, watch. All the, I'm going to show you how I turn cards over in the decks. Like, watch. watch. We have uh, ace of spades. Yeah. Most people turn over like a book or like kind of like a notepad. Yeah. But watch, I'm going to show you. I don't need your hands for this. If I just shake the cards, you see the ace of hearts turns over. Yeah. If I shake it, the ace of hearts turns down, and the ace of clubs turns over, which is weird. So I'll turn them all... I'll shake them, and now the ace of heart, uh, ace of diamonds turns over, right? Yeah. Why don't you see only one card, right? Yeah. Watch, I'll it's turn them all nice. face up. Right now, look, 100% all the cards are face down. Yeah. Did you see it? No. One card turned over. Morning. But here, watch, watch, watch. We'll do something a little different. Um, now, I use your hands for this. Bro, watch. <laughs> this is the ace of clubs. It doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of ink on it, right? right. So I'll put them a little farther apart. I'll wait for him. The ace of clubs, right? Yeah. It does, I want you to just follow the ace of clubs. I'm going to put the ace of clubs there and take, uh, what's this? My, this is going to be my card. I'm going to put it there. So now watch, watch. If I take it, just follow your card. Now without looking, where do you think the, the ace of clubs is? What do you think, I, you think it's there? Yeah. The weird thing is the ace of clubs here, ace of spades is here. You actually have the two red cards. Ooh. Which I know don't make no sense. Wow. I love close-up magic. It always, you know what can't be true. And yet there it is, right there. And you're watching, how did you do that? And it's always fascinating me. Because again, what is our sight saying to us? It's saying to us that the impossible that which is physically beyond the limits of this universe can happen. And we know better. This is one of the problems where we say, well, science will out. We'll just test that. Scientists are the most gullible people in the world. We are trained to look at facts. We are trained to look at the universe. We are trained to study it, study it carefully. And if Time and time and time again, the exact same set of circumstances leads to the exact same set of results. We go, oh, you might shut a Rika, but I'm calm. Oh, oh. And now you reorder your entire worldview. Except, of course, sleight of hand. If that person really, really, really wanted to do damage, they could. And it's one of those things Penn and Teller tell us all the time. This is not true. Do not believe it. We are fooling you. Hello? So what can we conclude? What do we know about sight? What do we know about our senses? <coughs> General statement. When you are looking for the details, you will always miss the big picture. You're counting the basketball. How many times has it bounced? and you miss the gorilla, and you miss the woman walking out, and you miss the curtain change, but by golly, you knew about 13, 16 times. Well, secondly, if you're looking for the big picture, you will miss the details. As we saw, people plopping up and down, changing race, changing color, something passes in front of your eyes, and suddenly a tall, white-haired man becomes a short, oriental woman, and you don't notice. Can two people sitting together, viewing the exact same thing, come to completely different conclusions? Sure. Happens all the time. Regularly. This is normal. And you sit there and say, what do you mean you didn't see that?
that's how this object works. Since your sense of the world is dependent upon your brain's interpretation, can you assert that your worldview is better than, superior to, more accurate than somebody else's? Oh dear. <laughs> what about right and wrong? Are they solely a matter of perspective? If I see the world differently than you do, and I say this is right, and you say this is wrong, which one of us is correct? Oh, isn't philosophy wonderful? <laughs> and science isn't helping. So, I leave you to struggle with these questions. Tune in, same time, same station, the third Sunday of October, and we'll explore more interesting things with thinking critically. <laughs>